<laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first, technically the first, um, technically the second, actually, episode of um, uh, Beauties and the Beasties. So here we are, it's myself and Sean, and I think um, for the first podcast this week, we're going to have a bit of a talk about how how we got here. So you can start this magical podcast journey with us um, and actually get to know a little bit more about the pair of us, which should be pretty mm -hmm. nice. So yeah. um, I don't know, Sean, do, do you want to start? How how do you get how did you get to be um, the ravishing pest controller that you are today then? Yeah, so I was always like a little bit of a weird kid and we had adult, bit of a weird kid. I think lots of pest controllers fall into that thing. If you can hear my children screaming and shouting in the background, let us know because I'm hoping the headphones should block them out, but I've got a funny feeling he's going to override it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I think pest control lends itself to people who aren't don't fit the stereotypical, and I was definitely not that. So um, I can remember when I was little... My dad always had dogs, like running dogs, and his dad had them and his dad had them. And I just grew up listening to stories of um, running dogs and sort of, I guess, what you would class now as um, agricultural pest control. Um, and it just fascinated us. So that was the, that was like the catalyst, the, the, the spark. Um, you know, what is it to say the, the, you take a spark and you turn it into a flame, and then you find the flame and it turns into a fire and the fire and the raging inferno type thing. So that would be the spark. And then probably the change or the real opportunity came when I was about 10 year old, I think I was, maybe it's nine, I can't remember. We moved house and we lived in um, a place called Westerhope, which was a bit more sort of city centre based. Um, it was a real rough area, council area. Um, it's even worse now, Craigie. Um, but we're real salt of the earth type of people. And then we moved out north. We moved up to a place called Wide Open. Um, for anyone from Newcastle, just north of Gosforth. Um, and at the bottom of my street was a lake. I went down the bottom of my street. I'd done a left and there was a little pond and then a lake behind there. So I started fishing. Um, massively so. And I was always... I'd be the lad who was out with a dog on his own. And through fishing, I bumped into a lad called Danny, who became my best pal, and he was on that wavelength, you know. And it just went from there. So we just would go fishing every, like, all the time, consistently, six weeks holiday. We'll spend all six weeks fishing. And then if we weren't fishing, we'd be ratching around. I had a little dog, um, Penny, she was called, a little whippet, staffy cross thing, couldn't run for toffee, but would kill anything if she could get a hold of it she just couldn't get a hold of anything um and then it just snowballed and snowballed danny went on to be a gamekeeper um i went on to be a police officer um always was involved in that so would be out and then that was probably around about that time 18 19 was when you became aware of the fact that it was as much conservation as it was killing um, I can remember we started doing a bit of beating for some lads um, and they kind of took us under their wing a bit and pointed in the right direction. That's not right. We can't be behaving like that. This is better. Head that way, blah, blah, blah. Um, he got in with the Game Conservancy Trust, the GCT, and they were running a project on um, birds of prey predation, where they would monitor things. So it was it was no longer just pest control. It was actually they were taking tick counts. They were um if we shot a fox, they would cut half of its jaw out so they could age well, it. Hang on, hang on. Hang on, but back up, they cut half of its jaw out. Yeah, so they could age the fox. That if it was a vixen. Nuts. Yeah, if it was a vixen, they would cut the uterus out of it. So you could see how many cubs it had had. So when you oh, cut that the is that is brutal. I mean, I know, I know it's sort of, um, yeah, you know, it's it's all post mortem at that point. But surely there must have been, you know, that's not the kind of thing you can talk about down the pub, really, is it? Uh, no, 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 definitely not, definitely not. And it was it was all done with scientists. This wasn't gamekeepers, so they they employed scientists to monitor six right. sites. Yeah, okay. Three of them were keepered, three of them were unkeepered, and they would monitor everything. 
um, every Corby that got shot would be put in a freezer and um, frozen and be sent off for analysis. And they would look at how keepering changed, you know, but they would look at medicated grit, they would look at tick numbers, they would look at all sorts, and it just fascinated us. So, and then when you combine that with the fact that we got lots and lots of permission to run dogs, because this was prior to the hunting ban, you know, um, it was just it was that, that is that is um bushcraft uh pest control at its mm. finest isn't it that is mm. that is really and, and weirdly enough that's it's almost it's so weird because i think we've uh we've touched on this conversation before just um previously just you and i it is almost the polar opposite the polar opposite of how i got into this industry like i mm. i came in from it couldn't be further from that um and it's a bit of it it's like i'm i'm legacy pest controls with my my father um let's start with him because it's all his fault uh, i mean a lot of how i am today is is as a result of him and just to give you a story not to do a pest control but to give you a story just about uh the relationship between myself and my father um mild man when he was at uh, he used to be at ici zeneca and left a born pelgar before uh it turned to Syngenta. um but he used to go out on those meetings uh, he used to work in a little cubicle little cubicle where um, you know, office to himself. And if you saw another person throughout the day, it was a miracle. So he sat there, jeans, T-shirt, jeans, T-shirt, uh, whereas all of the other managers and, uh, you know, seniors would sit there, full suit and tie. He's like, if I'm sitting in the office all day by myself, I'm going to be there comfortable. I'm not going to sit there wearing a starched shirt and a tie. Um, I'm going to be comfortable. So jeans and T-shirt and a pair of, pair of sort of like uh, work boots. And he constantly go down to the cafeteria and you get the piss taken out. Oh, you know, is it... Is it a, you know, a go easy day today or are you just rolled out of bed and all this stuff? And he was like, no, no. But at the same time, I'm comfortable. And then this, this went on for a long time. And then he went out to, uh, I think it was, uh, he was somewhere, somewhere Eastern Europe. And he got on so well with the people that he met. Now, trust me, this story is coming around. He got on so well that they bought him the ceremonial garb of their country. So they bought him these great big silk pantaloons that were bright blue this great big blue shirt a blue cape which had fur trim all the way down and this pair of half moon boots and half moon hats that had little tassels on them and one day he snapped <laughs> one day he had had so much of these people basically just telling him you look like a scruff that he turned up to work wearing this full ceremonial because he could wear whatever he liked there was no dress code he could so he turned up but and this is how I'm involved with the story. I was of the age when he did this, that I was still at primary school. He drove me to school wearing this full regalia. And uh, he drove me right to the door. And I was like, Dad, Dad, I love you. But please, <laughs> please just stay in the car. And he was just like, of course, of course, you know, I won't. I would do nothing to embarrass my firstborn son. Anyhow, I'm walking up the drive and suddenly hear this tank, tank. And I turn around and he's not just running up the drive behind me. He's got the bloody cape out like this, like a pair of wings. <laughs> running up. And he halfway up the drive and there's people looking out the window and there's all the kids in the schoolyard. And there's me just stood there rooted to the spot in absolute terror being like, it's happening. This is happening. And he like sweeps me off the floor and in a deep booming voice, Alex, my son, I love you. Plonk, a fun. And march back off, went to work. Um, so, yeah. Um, End of that story is, however, nobody would talk to my dad at uh, at work. Nobody would talk to him at all. Um, but the following day, he came in wearing a full shirt, tie, suit, and the rest of it. And everyone's peeking around his door to see if he's still having this crisis, you know, this, this, this breakdown. And they're like, oh, Joe, 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 good good to see you. You know, you got us all going yesterday, but glad to see you're back to normal. And he's like, yes, normal. And he pushes himself back from the seat, and he's got a pair of fluffy bunny slippers on, um, which he proceeded to wear in lieu of shoes for the rest of the day. Um, so, yes, um, that very much explains the genetic predisposition to being flat-out mental uh, that I have inherited from my father. Um, so, sorry, that, that story aside, how I actually got into pest control, however, is... That's something he did. He, he founded Pelgar, but he spent a lot of time in the Middle East. He spent a lot of time in... Uh, so go on. What? So how come he ended up leaving Syngenta and going to Pelgar? Uh, not leaving Syngenta. It was uh, it hadn't become Syngenta yet. So ICI, it's it, ICI, then, As uh, then Zeneca, then AstraZeneca, then Syngenta. I mean, that company has branched and diverged 
uh, many, many times over the years. Um, and, and I just believe at, at, at the point, it diverged so many times, and he's at an age of his life, it's like this, you know, there's only so many times you can survive this this night of the long knives thing before it becomes um, a bit of a bad joke. So he decided, you know, that he would go and set his own company up with another gentleman called uh, Gareth. Uh, and he and Gareth disappeared off and, and set up Pelgar in 1995. Uh, Pelgar now being... The, the largest or one of the largest manufacturers of rodenticides and insecticides uh, in the UK. So of, of that, uh, tremendously proud of both, uh, both of those men for being able to basically um, leave with nothing but uh, a grin and a can-do attitude. Uh, and over the course of 20 years, building that, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's something quite impressive. Um, and the thing is, is, you know, my father, I, he was, he employed me as, slave labor i did my work experience working for him in, in okay. a torpedo shed and wreck so so uh when pelgar started it wasn't what it is today you know um today or when i by the time i left it was um two, you know by the time i left it was two sites in the uk um half a dozen mm -hmm. sites around the world um a dozen or so factory buildings spread across the uk uh but when we started um it was just the pair of them and, and you know the various kids my brothers uh gareth um and and basically what happened with that is um we would go in evenings weekends school holidays and you sit there and you know we'd we would push where you know, my dad would make the wax blocks in a great big tray they'd cool down and me and my brothers would sit there by hand as they're cold popping them back out put them into a bucket you know it was it was shit like that you know literally working and the first factory they had was a torpedo shed it wasn't any bigger than a shipping container and it had an oil drum in the back um and, and a cement mixer and everything was made by hand everything was for, for years all of the all of the things were were made by hand um and you know one worker became two became three became four um and at some point i disappeared off to university with the intention of not actually following the family business i did Come on, let, let's have a guess here. What do you reckon my degree was in? I went to university. Um, so I, I honestly believe that you had a degree in entomology. No, no, nothing, nothing like well, it's, it's, it's a, it's a science uh, and it's biology, but it's nothing to do with insects at all. What is it? Marine biology and oceanography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's it. If you, if you've, uh, anyone who's ever noticed me wearing short sleeves before, I've got a, I've got a little squid on the back of one of my arms as a, as a homage to, to that time of my life. But yeah, I, I, I did that. I was fascinated by the sea, still am fascinated by the sea. Mm. Um, fascinated by the sea in the same way that you know when you see those pictures of those guys sat on top of a girder uh, in the Empire, you know, when they're building the Empire State Building, and it makes you feel a bit queasy. It's, it's yeah. an amazing photo. You can't yeah. help but look at it, but at the same time, you're like, nah, yeah. I don't like this. That's exactly the same picture. I, that's exactly the same feeling I get uh, when I look at the sea, because I'm like, that is fascinating, but it's fucking terrifying. The more, it, it, as I learned three years in marine biology, what I learned about the sea <laughs> stopped me going in the sea. Really? <laughs> There's terrifying things in there. I mean, yeah, the, the animals that live in the sea, um, I, on, on land, human beings are we are a one we are top of the chain nothing can stop us in the sea uh we <laughs> are middling at best everything does better than us in the sea uh we are you know we float atop it in big steel fortresses uh, and the second we get into it we are doomed so so, what, um, so, yeah. so you got your degree and then went back then just went so how did you jump from getting your degree to going full-time with your dad at palgar well, this was it. So I kind of came back and I came back because I knew the work because I've been working there for the last five years on the factory floor. Um, and I've just been doing you know, and it was easy. I came back and I was like, well, while I look for a proper job to do with my degree, um, which spoiler alert, there's not a lot of marine biology in the UK unless you want to lay oil or uh, BT cables through the ocean. Um, and I was like, I'll, I'll just work on the factory floor. It's nice and easy. My brother worked there at the same time as well. So we just spend days sacking off tons and tons and tons of grain. You know, one day I think we managed to, by hand, sack, stitch and stack 13 tons of grain between the pair of us. So we, we had traps like little rhinoceroses, uh, but it was nice. It was cheap. It, well, I say it was, it, was, it, it was easy work with a good group of people, uh, good camaraderie. And it was, um, it was fun. Um, and I really dragged my heels because... It actually dawned on me that 
Uh, and I, I'd sit in with my old man on a lot of these meetings. I'd start to learn the politics of the industry. I'd start to learn how these things worked because, of course, he was he was up here and I'd just sort of like sit in and listen to him and absorb it by osmosis. And then one day, both he and Gareth turned around and said, you know, they just sat me down and went, why are you here? <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean, why are you here? And they're like, you got a degree. You don't, got a degree, which, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of biology and statistics in your degree. Go on, go do something better. And I was like, uh, and then Gareth turned around and said, you know what? We spend so much money. We spend so much money sending, um, our in, you know, sending our insecticides off to testing uh, in other labs. Um, we'd only have to basically do three or four of those in-house a year. And we will have made back the money that we um, spent sending them to external labs. So how do you fancy, instead of buggering off, using your biology knowledge and your statistical knowledge to build our very first lab? And I was like, yeah, fucking brilliant. So, and I thought when it, when it built the lab, I thought I'd be sort of like little yellow jacket, overcoat, you go there, you go there. No, it was me and one chippy. Um, and we built a two-story freestanding structure within a warehouse. It was 16 rooms. Um, when the fire warden came around to check it out, at, at first he had kittens, and then after two hours of walking around, went, I can't actually find anything wrong with this place. Uh, I honestly thought this would be an in and out and you'd be off. Um, but genuinely, it's all fine. And the chippy was stood there all sort of like happy days. So yeah, I built it and it was uh, it was our So first was that the spark? That was the was spark. That, that was that, that was, was the start the spark. Of, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was the change from me basically enjoying being with my family at work to actually having an active contribution to to the company uh, and then from there it was eight years i ran that little lab eight years of breeding every insect you can imagine every pest insect that you guys deal with are bred in those labs uh, at, at some point so um, how did you learn to breed insects uh, a lot of books. Um, my father actually did it as well. So my father worked at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uh, for a short time. I believe he had a, a brief stint at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene as well. Um, and so he knew how to do some of the trickier species like mosquitoes uh, and bits and bobs like that. So a lot of basically learning from him, a lot of learning from books um, and also a lot of trial and error. I fucked up a lot. Um, and, you know, not, not, not enough to make it commercially unviable, obviously, but I solidly believe that actually those years of me learning how, learning how to keep all of the pest insects alive, their quirks, what they like to eat, what they don't like to eat, you know, the foods, the conditions that will kill them, actually made me a much better, um, you know, pest manager and trialist going forwards, because I knew exactly where these animals were going to live, because... I knew what they needed to survive. I needed, I knew what they needed to thrive, yeah. uh, and I knew what they'd be avoiding in the terms of, you know, that's that they, they like humid environments. Yeah, actually, but that's too humid. That will fuck them up. That will kill them. So I, I learned a lot about killing animals by keeping them alive, which sounds really counterintuitive, but it was a, it was a tremendous learning curve. Um, but there was a lot of reading old papers. A huge amount of research was done in the 50s and 60s and the early 70s on cockroaches. And then it kind of stopped because nobody gave a shit after that. It just kind of dropped off the map. Um, but you'd end up reading uh, mad, completely weird papers just to see their methodologies as to how they kept their insects alive for the trial. The trial meant, you know, we weren't interested in what the, the research they were doing. We were just trying to find those three or four sentences so reading through 100 i think one of the funniest trials I ever found they're measuring the reaction times of insect legs but they didn't want to puff a little air on you know usually when you measure reaction times of mammoths you puff a little bit of air onto something and you measure how quickly an eye closes or you know something flinches but with cockroaches they're trying to measure the reaction time um in the ganglion in their armpits basically not in their brain so they couldn't puff a little bit of air onto them because that would be a stimulus all over so what they did, and I shit you not, this paper was amazing. They glued a tiny cannon to the back of a cockroach, a tiny, or they glued it to the back of it, fired it. And of course, the, the inertia threw it one way and they saw how quickly it recovered because that was a thought process that didn't require time. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a tangent. Um, but yeah, long story short, I got to the labs, eight years in the labs. Then I moved over to Church Farm. So those of you listening that know of Church Farm. So yeah, stop because I've heard of Church Farm, oh. but I'm not sure what the setup was of Church Farm, why mm. why we lost it, what it actually did, who funded it, who was responsible for it. Oh. I, all I know about Church Farm 
or, or what I think I know about Church Farm is that it's a place where they bred rats and mice and monitored their behaviour for pest control reasons. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. So it was started by a gentleman called uh, Steve Havers, Dr. Steve Havers, uh, and it was his father-in-law's farm. Uh, and it had been his father, and it was a it was a poultry farm for many many years. Um, and then, as the poultry industry declined, and as more of the poultry industry moved away to to Europe, um, the, it, Steve started to annex more and more of the site. And the site basically was two sodding great big long chicken sheds, huge long great big chicken sheds. Um, but of course, as as less poultry were there, he increased it and he he started off as being sort of like an observation center and a, a bit of a research center and as it grew on more people took an interest so there was a training room bolted onto the side and for years and years and years steve basically ran this place um catering to uh some of the biggest service train companies in the uk they'd send all their technicians down there to get trained because it's one of these places there's a training room great but also you look through the window to the right 150 rats bopping about happy as you like um and it just meant that people could say right on the screen here is a rat and rats do this and there's the rat doing just, just that thing over there uh, and me and my father got on very well with steve um and we would go down there uh on on the semi-regular and um it, it, it got to the point where steve was running this on himself um it, it was it was a lot of work and we said you know what what would be an interesting thing is the um the lease is coming up on my labs over in Alton. Why don't we collapse my labs and then rebuild them down here? And not only that, I'll bring me, so an extra pair of hands, my staff, an extra three pair of hands, um, and then we'll be able to do, you know, we'd have the insects and the rodents and all of the stuff in one place, plus a training room. Plus it had these wonderful scenarios. So there's an attic, there's a bedroom, there's a kitchen. Um, there was a little sort of like warehouse uh, towards the there's a rifle range down there so it's a 30 meter rifle range so people could you know indoors as well uh had everything you needed basically to train and learn about pest control and, and from our point of view uh the company's point of view uh we paid steve a rent on that and that rent uh was covered by us running training through it so we ran the training we took the money from the training um it covered the costs of us being down there covered the costs of my staff being down there and he was all very happy and it was all very happy and shiny until covid and then the doors closed because we couldn't do any more training because of COVID. And because we couldn't do any more training, a commercial decision was made that what's the point in having two, you know, on the books, two great big long chicken sheds, um, when realistically we we could then recollect, we could take the lats, which was the whole, you know, the investment that Algra made, and we could move them back in-house. Um, and instead of having to pay rent on two chicken sheds, we'll simply pay rent on two rooms in, in the factory. Um, and so that's the, the decision was made to basically, and it was it was commercial as all of these things are. No, nothing, no hard feelings, and no sort of like um, you know uh, animosity in it. It was just simply why pay for two long buildings when we just need two moderately sized rooms. So it was collapsed down and moved back. But unfortunately, um, that meant that Church Farm at that point, you know, indeterminate length of time closed down, never reopened. So that was that was quite a sad, quite a sad moment there. Um, but that's that's pretty much closed. You know that that is the condensed version of, of how I got here. And as you say, it, it's it's a completely so go on. You know, we haven't, haven't got there yet because COVID hit. You were at oh, Palgo. Yeah. <laughs> you were at Palgo when at, COVID hit. Yes, I was at Palgo. And then and that was the the next spark which kicked you from Palgo into the environmental. It was yeah. It, it kind of um, at that point. Um, with all of the change going on and everything else up in the air, I sat there and I thought, you know, I I was, what, 35 at the time? And I thought, you know, if there was ever a chance for me to go, if my, my father founded Pelgar when he was, um, you know, 35, 36. And I thought, you know, if he can do it, if he can do it. I can do it. This is the time. This is this is the time for me to to jump and do my thing. Um, and, and so it was no other reason than that. I basically decided that this was my moment to become um, my own person. While all of this is up in the air, while it's all in flux, um, they ain't going to miss me that bad. Let's go and start. So, yeah, at the, at the beginning of the world's greatest uh, pandemic in living memory, uh, the start of the world's global recession, I thought, you know what, the best thing to do is to leave 
uh, the job that I've been doing for the last 15 years, I know how to do very well and I get on very well with all the people. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a company with no one on the books, <laughs> you know, literally just uh, it was January the 1st, uh, Wade Environmentals Incorporated. It was like, hi, guys. Uh, that was it. Started trading on on the first and on the second. I was on the phone being like, <laughs> does anybody want any work from me? Um, but it didn't take long. Uh, and, you know, so three years so later, what? So it, what is the business model that you have now, then, if you don't mind us asking? Uh, I'm not sure it has an official term. Actually, no, I'm, I'm always certain it has an official term. Uh, lackadaisical and a bit crap uh, is probably the business model I run to. But no, no, the honest, the honest answer to that is the business model I run to is... Uh, it's probably easier to, to tell you what the, the ethos or, or the drive behind Wade Environmental is, because that influences the business model. Um, I honestly believe that Wade Environmental and the, the purpose of Wade Environmental in this industry is to raise the profile of this industry, both by um, holding people to account, but also by providing support and raising us up. I don't believe in our, this industry that we should ever lower the bar on um, quality and standards, but I do solidly believe in providing everyone with a step ladder and the tools to have the best opportunity to get over that bar. We need to have high standards and high accountability, but also we need to have um, the ability to get there. And so, yeah, but I mean, you're this... not a, you're not daft, right? You're 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 a clever no. guy. Like, how do you monetize all of that learning that you have had? From your dad setting that up and popping out wax blocks all the way through to testing and designing chemicals and understanding that industry that that's like totally alien to me how do you, how do you monetize that it's a really hard thing actually um because you know you guys are are, are selling services tangibly you can see it you turn up um here you go here are the tools in the back of my van these are the things i'm going to do and those fuzzy things are going to fall over whereas the life of the consultant is a lot more I'm going to tell you something that you probably actually already know, but you've never thought about in a certain way. Um, and I'm going to ask yeah, but you. The, yeah, I think I think you I think you've just dropped something in there. So part of your revenue stream is consultancy. So yeah. you'll go and do field biologist stuff and all that. Yeah, yeah. So, so do yeah, do, I'll do biology. What? I'll do product testing. So to today, for ah, example. There, there you go. Yeah. So tell us yeah. about that 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 interests me. Tell us about that product testing because I, oh, I so... th this this is something which absolutely like makes my head spin because I think how do I get involved in that from a boots on the ground perspective? Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, there's so much. So I'm going to start this statement uh, and parrot something I wrote in Pest Mag with um, Gemma Sutherland a little while back, which was we as an industry are super. We are really data poor. You know, the manufacturers and distributors generate a lot of data, but it's all commercially sensitive. I know this for a fact. I used to work for one of them. I used to make a lot of data. But the problem was, is that data goes to support a specific package or a specific question. Uh, and they can't release that information out there because someone else could just run with that data and, and, and put their own um, submissions in. So on the face of it, uh, in terms of white papers, we're super data poor. Um, but there is a lot of data that is, is is generated. And so for folks like yourself, actually what you guys can do in order to help us. So here's a question to you. How much data do you generate every time you go to a field? How much how much research do you do? How much data do you generate every time you go onto a field site? We, we generate, uh, sorry, sorry. We, we will probably generate an incomprehensible amount of data. I think the problem is we don't capture yeah. it, do we? Yeah, exactly. That. We, I was about to say. It goes in. It goes into your brain cells, and you learn, mm -hmm. and then it's like, right, yeah, seen that, done that, and you've learned it, and mm -hmm. then you're on the next one because, because our business model is based around that revenue income. Sitting yes. down and capturing that data becomes difficult. I've thought yeah. about data capture in relation to the bees, and um, for a whole different yeah, range yeah. of things. But yeah, like, so would I'm guessing that your the people who you would love to do work for as an ideal would be the large multinationals um, in product testing, um, rentals and all them. And then from a boots on the ground, it would be sort of your BRC sites and stuff like that. Is that, is that what I'm, yeah, I'm that, I mean, up right? Yeah. So my, yeah, to, to, to break the business model down into three things, it's three P's. It's um, professional, personal, and product. So professional is the auditing, the BRC sites, the field biology, the making sure that your companies 
are doing what they should do in terms of compliance um, and the rest of it. The personal is all the training I do. It's trying to get you guys over that bar, trying to get you to the point where you are um, comfortable to walk into any site and say, you know what, I am the mutts nuts, the rats, you know, be like all of these things and speak with confidence on your thing. And the third P of course is product. So that's all of the products in the market. Um, I would love, you know, I'd love to do with the help of guys um, like yourself and, and everyone out there to create like a witch guide. I mean, how good would that be? A witch guide for pest control products. You know, nothing, something that didn't have bias, uh, something that people could flick through. Because, you know, the only thing we're ever taught, you flick through any catalog and the only data you're only given is the marketing data. And marketing, yeah. you know. And you know the other thing as well is, I've spoken to a number of technical advisors from different distributors and they've said basically our job is just reading the labels, knowing the labels and telling the pest controllers when they ring up because pest controllers will not read the labels. And I get it. You're too busy. And the, I think some of them get a little bit upset because they're like, have you not read the label? And I think if we did, you wouldn't have a job. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> we don't have, as a pest controller, I don't have time to read. 57 labels for identicides, I want to be able to pick up the phone, ring my distributor and say to them, what I am doing this, what works, what doesn't work, or at least what are my options, right? Well, you need something with outdoors on it. It needs to be this. It needs to be that. You've got you've got three products, you know, mm -hmm. we'll sell a lot of this one. That one's been a bit poor. So that witch guide, if you could, if you could turn that label into a, easy to understand format for someone you know very much like a um, you go on the you go on a website you go on you go on weird weird environment then you click rats external um blah 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 and it says here's your products brilliant mm -hmm. brilliant but I, I you know i'll always be dead honest i've used products where it's only after i've used them that i've realized i've used them off label before I, I mean, that. That, that's, that, that's a risk, isn't it? And I'm, I'm sure you're not the only one. I'm sure everyone out there has at some point had that uh, snafu, that, uh, you know, cold dread moment where you're like, should I have done that? Should yeah. uh, And no, no, I probably shouldn't. But of course, it's, it's a difference between, um, you know, uh, that's responsibility and accountability is, is making it right or making uh, making it safe more than anything else, um, either before or after the fact. Um, but yeah, so it's the, the, the field trial stuff is... It's fascinating. And only like, as I say, to today, today's job um, has been I've been around four farms today to do surveys to try and find one uh, that is sufficiently ratty um, to undertake a trial. Because field trials are a bit weird. You can't just do it on one or two rats because it's not enough data. Uh, and if you have two or three hundred rats, then it also doesn't work particularly well because it, you just get swamped by noise. You need to find a real sweet spot. So it becomes a bit of a bit of a, and so this is what I did actually. So when I was at the labs, um, you know, my first labs all the way through to uh, when I left, I, I was Mr. Ronsil. I did what it said on the tin. If it said it killed flies, then I had to prove it killed flies in the lab. If the label said it killed rats, I had to take it out from the field and prove it killed rats. So for somebody who is uh, a technical person in a manufacturing company, I spent a lot of time, a lot of time doing pest control because, and it was a bit, it was very different because when you guys go out and you might do three or four sites, uh, a day and then he won't return to them for a week two weeks a month whatever um what i was doing was going to one or two sites a month but i was going to them every single day every single day so as opposed to sort of like getting a little view over a lot of sites i was getting a big view over a very small amount of sites uh, and so it allowed me to sort of like a, a wonderful degree of like precision. I could see exactly how the rats were interacting with things. I could see that most rats would get over their neophobia in about five to seven days. Um, but the neophobia wouldn't be a case of you're done, you know, boxes are fine. They'd actually sort of, but you'd see the different stages, like because you were back there every day, you'd see the rats, you'd see the tracks coming closer and closer and closer to the wall box. And then you'd see the tracks going over the top of the box. Um, and then you'd see the tracks going through the box, but they'd ignore the bait. And then you'd see the tracks moving up to the bait and the bait would just be kicked everywhere inside the box. So they'd, they'd run up to it, dig through it, wait for it to, I don't know, explode or something, and then not touch it. And then like two days later, then they'd start eating. So actually neophobia that we, we imagine is just this one thing, it's the fear of going in the box, is actually, a, it's a whole spectrum of events leading up to that acceptance so actually being able to do the field trials and the lab stuff uh gave me a really different view 
And of course, when I was doing all of these field trials, uh, I wasn't doing them in isolation. I was working with, um, you know, just regular, regular pest managers. And so I was wicking up knowledge from them. I was taking on this stuff. And it's one of the things in this industry, I think that we really suffer with, is people don't talk enough. Um, people don't, they're, they're not honest about where things fail. They're not honest about uh, the problems they're having because they don't want to seem uh, like, a, like a dick to their peers. But actually, um, I find it tremendously insightful to hear how things go wrong uh, from everyone because that's, that's how we start making things better. Isn't it? Exactly say there, I picked the wrong product. You know, one of the biggest things I think screws our industry up. Go on. It's the rain. No, no, it's not the, the, the biggest thing. Bad weather. I would argue, and, I, and I'd like to hear your feedback on this, but I know for a fact that like, when I was having to do sort of like um, 40 or 50 external boxes on a trial, um, I would, you know, having, having to walk around a wet site in the rain, you know, either making recordings or opening up every box or kneeling down or getting into the mud, it's fine for a couple of times, but if you're doing it day in, day out, that's when people start to get really, ah, oh, you know, I was here yesterday, I was here the day before, I was here last week, nothing's happening over there. And to get over there, I need to climb over a fence and through that ditch and through that stuff. Fuck it, I'm not gonna do it. You know, having the wrong clothes on, having to sit in your van in the same causes people to basically um, not have the same level of diligence. I think, I, I think, yeah, and when you see these companies who are like, um, not giving their staff their full clothes, uh, you know, rain jackets and the rest of it. I, I think it's probably one of the biggest, um, I think biggest that, hurdles to get See, we, we don't do a lot of that box stuff. Like, we just don't do a lot of it. Um, and it probably comes from me because I hate it. Where you know, I, I know what we do well and I know what we do poorly. We are poor at the box kicking stuff, like really poor. Mm. Um, I don't understand it. Like, it, it goes against my my logical train of thought. Hang on, you know, hang on, hang on, sorry. My, my, my mic's just running out of battery. You keep talking. Yeah, I don't... I, I yeah, don't... Go. It's gone. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm I don't... Um, get my other mic. Yeah, go, go get it, yeah. <laughs> Can you still hear me or not? Not yet. I'm sure I'll be back in a minute, folks. How long have we been on for now? Can't be long, can it? Uh, 40 minutes. We're going to, just for anyone who is watching, I think what we're going to probably try and do is we're probably going to try and keep this to an hour every week. So when we get to the hour, it stops regardless of where we're at. Um, but yeah, yeah, the box kicking stuff. And I, I, when you say about the rain and the climbing over the, I'll climb over any fence to get to a problem. The thought of climbing over a fence and through a ditch to get somewhere, knowing that there's nothing there, is absolutely soul destroying. Like soul destroying to me. I'm like, it's just not how I'm put together. Um, so I, I, I agree with you 100 percent of what what sickens people and why, you know, they call them box kickers, don't they? Why box kickers get get themselves down over stuff? Because the truth is, if I was doing that, I'd get down. You know, I'd I'd hate it, but. The caveat to that is we've probably been looking at it a little bit more. I've got a lad who works for us now who is that way inclined. He likes dot his I's, he likes crossing his T's, etc. etc. And I'm like, yeah, he could do that work and he'd enjoy that work. And it's forced me to look at it a lot more carefully. And now I'm starting to look at it thinking, actually, if you do this properly, it's not box kicking. If you, you know, we looked at your um fly catch analysis thing, and I'm like, I find that quite interesting. And the thing which captivated me about that was when you said <laughs> fly catch analysis goes wrong when people don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ooh, I like that because that plays into my psyche of I I'm looking for something here. Like, and when I see these numbers rising, then I've got to start digging. And I'm like, that proper, that for the first time ever since I've been a pest controller, taking bees out of the equation. Insects have become interesting because I find them proper boring. I hate doing them, you know. So yeah, um, 
So, so on the back of that, I mean, that's what really you you talk about how uh, regular pesties can get involved with testing and stuff like that, right? Um, I know of at least one company, and I'm sure it's not the only one. And what they do is they set their technicians um, like um, data to capture. I think it's fantastic, and I, I'm trying to do the same things to write some like open source protocols. But as you say, it's soul destroying to go around and check every box and know that nothing's happening. But what if in, you know, as you were going around and checking every box, you were also generating a little bit of data each time you went around. You know, when you opened up the box, not just looking for the, you know, and you're not just looking for uh, bait tape and the rest of it, but what happens if we start to get people to count the number of slugs that are in boxes? What happens if we start to get people to count, um, you know, other factors around them? And then all that data compiles in and suddenly you can be like, ah, oh, you, it, the law of large numbers, which I think I've mentioned before, means that all of that data, as it comes in, suddenly starts to mean something. It makes your routines less mundane. It makes them interesting because you're actually contributing to a much wider project. Um, so you, you, you're part of a bigger community. What you're doing, even if there's no rat activity, matters because that data can then be used to then, you know, have these conversations about, you know what, um, almost all monitoring blocks are, you know, this is... Uh, a wild conjecture it's probably untrue but you know imagine if we found that the majority of monitoring blocks were eaten by slugs before they're eaten by rats what does that tell us as an industry do we need to start looking at how we monitor for rodents what if um you know at certain times of year so the one of the things that i'm i'm doing just for a bit of uh, interest is i've I, out in the out in the woods behind my labs every month i put a rat into a mesh cage and i go back and i have a look at it every week um, it's got a little temperature data logger there because what I've found informally and I'm starting to write this up more formally now is that as you might expect rats over the summer rat carcasses over the summer disappear almost instantly flies get in there carrion beetles get in there they just vanish and they get destroyed I would imagine well before um, most scavenging animals have a chance to find them you know, if the scavenger animal doesn't find that animal straight away, it is quite literally worm food within about two or three days. However, flip side of that, over winter, that carcass will remain in relatively good condition, sat out on the um, floor for several weeks, if not longer. When do we get most rat infestations? It's over winter. 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 Yeah. What happens with predatory birds over winter? They, they're going to need to feed because they're losing energy, they're losing fat. Um, and so with that, if you've got a nice carcass sat on the floor that's in relatively good nick, suddenly, you know, so with that bit of data, what do you do then? Well, you don't panic. You just need to know that over winter, you need to be much more vigilant to have a look for rodent carcasses because that's going to be more of an issue. Uh, whereas over summer, worm meat, you know, that one you've missed in the bush, although you need to find it, is is... is going to be gone so it's little things like that that we can all do that we can all get involved with um and this is kind of like the, this is this intersection this i kind of like like this concept because this is you know you coming from over here and me coming from over here and this is all the shit that we can be doing in the middle together uh which fascinates me at the end of the day yeah so after that fly kill analysis i was sitting there thinking actually we, we've got a couple of farms that we just trap um we're pretty we, we don't make any money in it at all but I think it gives people a good grounding in behaviour. Um, not ju Probably not so much from a neophobia point of view, more from a movement point of view. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how they're getting there, when they're getting there, what's causing them to get there, why they're moving, why they're not moving, what's the external factors that's causing those rats to move onto that farm. You know, I think it, it's great. But it does raise that thing of if we can do this fly catch analysis for fly trays, like why could I come up with something where we could do this for rats and now mice? Because we, believe it or not, I've started yeah. trapping mice on the farm. Um, oh, what, what, what kind? Field or, or house? Well, they're... they're and exactly that, yeah. So what was happening was I'd moved a load of my bee stuff into a um, an old dairy, but it's like when I say an old dairy, it hasn't been in use for a long, long time. Um, and obviously, mice love eating anything that the bees have touched, old comb, etc. And you want to protect it, so I started setting some um, 
traps about. And there's there's barn owls nest um roost in there of an evening, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we haven't caught one field mouse. Everything has been a house mouse. And it, it really made us sit there and think, this is quite interesting, actually, because everyone's like in I'm always the biggest um biggest critic of crew and the agricultural sector, et cetera, et cetera, for because I think they're responsible for the redenticide traces in thing, you know. But it's always and I was always like, well, farmers are to blame, blah, blah, blah. And the reality of it is the tuck redenticides are field mice. But from what I'm seeing from trapping mice on that farm, it wouldn't have made a difference anyways, because I absolutely 110% could justify using escorts around that farm to kill house mice and rats. Because we get rats externally um, and within their buildings, every single mouse that we have caught has been a house mouse. It's a really interesting way of looking at things. And so we have barn owls up here on, on the IPM farm. And it is... We've, we've peeled apart the um, skulls, uh, sorry, the skulls. We've peeled apart the, the um, pellets to have a look at the skulls. And yeah, it's overwhelmingly um, field mice and bank bulbs that we, uh, sorry, field bulbs that we find um, in, in the skulls. Now, that's not to say, it, one of the uh, grain silos over here, um, when I started, often with, with house mice, not anymore, but it, it, it was. Um, and we didn't find any house mice skulls in, in the pellets. And I spoke, the guy from the barn, uh, Barn Owl Trust, I think it was, came down um, because we put a Barn Owl box up here because we found Barn Owls uh, nesting in some hay bales. So we transferred them into a, into a box after they'd all done their thing. Um, and I spoke to him and I was talking about Barn Owls and he said, yeah, they're, they're actually a bit a bit crap in the UK. You find you find hundreds of them, you know, they're, they're almost plague-like in, in places like Africa. But in the UK, they're not that good a predator because they have very long wings um, and they have to have open areas, open ground in which to hunt. So they yeah. don't do well in woods like tawny owls. Um, and although they nest in barns, they don't tend to hunt around the barn itself yeah. because there's not enough open ground. So they disappear out into the fields. So actually the things that are on the farm don't tend to be the prey of the um, barn owl. It's the things out in the field coming towards the farm. And I suppose you say you're, you're not a big um, advocate of crew, but some of the things they do make sense. So if you're talking about in and around buildings, you need to prove that those rodents are coming from the bank into the into the buildings, and then you control them. Because if they're going from the bank into the field, that's when they get picked up by the barn owls, isn't it? That's when, and that is when you do get sort of like uh, all of those rodents picked up by them. Because as soon as they start going into that, um, you know, the, the no man's land of open ground, that's when they are predated by by barn owls. Uh, not necessarily, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a barn owl picking off house mice inside a grain elevator. It's not to say they wouldn't hop down from the floor and pick one up that was acting dopey. And I suppose so, as well. So is... j just to clarify, it, my, my complaints with crew are, I just think it was a bit of a, um, how can I say this without, I don't mind upsetting people, but how can I say this and getting it across correctly? I think the reality of crew is it was sold to us that this is in your interest, and it wasn't. It was in the manufacturers of poisons interest, so they could continue to sell our escorts for as long as possible. Could, before we lose it, which I'm absolutely certain at some point we will, could we have kept them? I think we probably could have if I had just stopped selling to the um, to the agricultural sector. Um, but the reality of it is, when you're running a big business like that and you've got thousands of mouths to feed, then figures do become important, you know. And you can't mm. you can't get rid of one hundred ninety thousand farms and go. This is what the purists do. I don't, uh, you know. I think it was a little bit pissing up your back and telling you it's raining, um, and I think. In it, you know, they've got lots of scientists. It would be relatively easy to work out where these traces were coming from. You go to a pest controller, you go to a farm, you set some snapback traps, and you test the, the mice that you catch for um for a denticide, and then you go into <laughs> um I'm a second. Dozy son, come. <laughs> So, but yeah, just a, just and, a, 
and you could have tell, and I, I'm pretty confident that you would have found those traces of rodenticide within those mice in an agricultural sector. Would you have found them if you had went into uh, an estate where, you know, where you, the sort of, what, what I'd class as a urban estate, we have Ingleby round our way, where you get feet, you get pretty much every every mouse that you will get within the house is a field mouse. Um, and yeah, that's not barking, you know? I absolutely can hear the dog barking, yeah. Hang on a second. <laughs> I'm going upstairs. So, this, so, this so, is, so, Alex, what, what, you don't have children, um, but what you will find is when you get them, even though you say to them, please, please, I'm like one hour a week, it's it's still not enough. Um, <laughs> you know, they just it's it's like um it's like the forbidden fruit when dad says to you, please be quiet for an hour. It's like I can't be quiet for an hour. You know, and then they'll wind the dog up and all that. But anyways, yeah, and I just think there was a lot of a lot of testing they could have done, which and hasn't there is been actually, done. But it has. Um, so we have the Wiz um, does that kind of testing. We have the APHA, um, which is involved with uh, the resistance tail samplings as well. So there are labs out there that are doing this type of uh, data analytics. Um, and it used to be years ago that um, when you were doing field trials, you would um, collect data for, for, for pathology just to see, to, just to make sure that the animals had died from what you had, uh, from what you've done, as opposed to something coincidental. So the data is out there. How it's used, however, is probably the, the bigger question. Um, but the, uh, so the predatory bird monitoring scheme and WIZ and crew collect barn owl corpses every year in order to test them for residues. That's how we are testing the, the residues in there. Uh, and I think out of every year, it's 100 birds, and it's been running for six years now, seven actually, that died including this year. Um, but for the last six years, 600 birds or so, only one uh, bird, the death of one bird is linked inconclusively, but potentially to the um, consumption of escars through secondary poison. With all of the others, they contain SDRs, but it was probably a contributing factor. But by far and away, the thing that kills most barn owls is motor vehicles. Cars. Yeah, um, cars. Cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but this is, and this is the thing, isn't it? Because my understanding of it is, and correct us where I'm wrong, the problem is that the, the trace amounts that they have in them isn't going to roll them over, but it stops them from fledging young. It stops that population from flourishing. Potentially, yes. So this was all based on the Baltic Line back in 2015, sorry, 2013-14, just before stewardship came into effect. There was, um, we had one of the worst years on record for barn owl fledgings in the UK. Um, and with that, they had to look, and of course, you've got the whole uh, poison spring saga, haven't you? You've got um, the, the fear of DDT um, destroying eggs. And so the first thing they looked at, the first thing they looked at was rodenticide, sorry, pesticide residues within um, barn owls that they found. And they found alarmingly in kites and barn owls, oh my God, all of these, you know, 80% of these animals are containing a residue. Could this be a factor for the reduction? Hang on a second, stop that there. Stop, hang on yeah, a second, yeah, yeah. stop that there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. That didn't. So I've always been under the impression that when they've tested them, all they've found is rodenticides. They're actually finding pesticides as well. Uh, there are other pesticides that are found in in these animals, yes. But the ones we are looking at from uh, from the you know crew, the campaign uh, responsible rodenticide use only really looks at that um, those those aspects. But I believe one of the there's a paper that came out uh, either last year or the year before. Um, that had um, that was looking at a broader spectrum of, of pesticides found within uh, these animals, but the ones we look at are, are simply the rodenticides. Um, and, but but with that, they they this is they, see they, this is this this is what infuriates me though because it's like is it the agricultural sector probably? And I've got lots of friends who are farmers and will probably want to kill us for saying it, but the reality of it is it's not just their rodenticide use; it's their pesticide use as well, then, isn't it? You know, but I'll, I'll almost guarantee you that on the figures of um, pesticides that they sell, they won't be under the scrutiny that the redenticides will be under. I'd be, you know, because... Well, are you sure? Because they have to sign in and out all of the chemicals they go onto the field. They they have to, certainly the farms that I'd be on to, they... I don't, they I don't mean scrutiny like that. 
Yeah, I don't yeah. mean scrutiny like that. I mean, we've got crew, this campaign which is running and you know, why it's turning up and blah, blah, blah. Is there a campaign running for insecticide, um, pesticide use in barn owls? Are they doing anything about that? No, no, no. Well, the, the, the funny thing about this, to, to, to finish the, the story, is um, I think 2015, 16, actually, when stewardship came in, we saw some of the highest numbers of barn owl fledgings. And we looked back over, we, uh, as a you know a scientific yeah. collective, not we being me specifically, um, probably the thing that caused the crash in barn owl numbers that was first um, recorded was the fact it was one of the wettest years on record mm -hmm. at, a, at, at the time of fledging. And it probably just drowned a huge number of field vole nests. So although there was field voles and bank voles adults there, they didn't have as many young because simply they were just washed out to sea, metaphorically or probably literally. And so less prey, less available food, more youngsters failed to fledge as a result of starvation. Um, and it led to this dip. But then, of course, following year when you have numbers of uh, voles coming up and of course voles have a seasonal cycle as well i believe it's a three and five year um boom cycle with voles so every so often when those numbers coincide you'll have a you'll have a low year for voles um just as a as a natural sort of like uh cycle um and and that probably had some contributing factor to have that as well so with that yeah you know it is all of these factors but rodenticides were for good or bad, they didn't necessarily cause that dip in barn owl fledging, but it did highlight that shit, there's a lot of them out there. You know, we were expecting to find a little bit. We weren't expecting to find bar, uh, red kites, you know, 80% of red kites to have a residue in them of one level or another. Um, it was it was nuts. Hang on a second. <laughs> Go away and I'll come when I'm done. <laughs> Go away and I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I just love it because I can remember being seven and it's just, you know, he, he's very he's very much his father's son. Like I can see I can literally watch him and understand exactly how his brain works. And he'll say stuff to us and he'll look at us and I'll think and I'll say to him, you know, I was seven, don't you? Well, really, what I should say is, you know, I was seven and exactly the same as you. Like, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it. You know, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Comes in. I, I just but love him. He's just mint. I, I always remember when I was uh, younger, me, and I have uh, two brothers who are relatively close in age to me, two younger brothers. Um, and my parents would have, you know, they'd have friends over. You'd be... Right, to bed, to bed, everyone go to bed. Uh, so we're all sent upstairs, you know, hear the doors open, parents come in, cocktail parties abound. Um, and then my brothers and I would get together and be like, right, what should we do? What should we, and, you know, we would either sort of like, uh, just play, or one of our fun games was see how far into the living room where my yeah. parents and their friends were, how far into the living room you could get before without you were being discovered. spotted yeah 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 yeah, without, yeah, without yeah, being spotted. yeah. so you'd, you'd sit there and you'd very slowly sort of like creep the door open and then you yeah. would just belly crawl yeah. behind the sofa <laughs> yeah. and, in. and, and yeah. either my parents knew or just like do not do not engage with the small child ah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Make them or they yeah. genuinely had no idea that yeah. i was just basically like this tiny little Worm wiggling behind the sofa, being like, "Yeah, I'm so cool." Um, so, oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. He's, he's mint. <laughs> he's mint. He is. He's just a lovely little kid. He's got he's got a heart of gold. So I couldn't get things, but yeah, I, yeah, crew it. I, I get it. I understand why it's there. I don't have any problems with it being there. I don't like the way it's sold the pest controllers. Just don't like it. Um, hmm. as if it's like done with our interests at heart. And the reality of it is, I just don't think it is. I think it's. I, I think it's done by the chemical manufacturers for the chemical manufacturers, which I don't have a problem with. They're running a business. They're running very big businesses. They're keeping the doors open and the lights on. I absolutely get it 100%. But just be honest with you and just say, listen, we're going to try and keep this for as long as we can. Um, you know, if we go, then you lose everything. And you're like, okay, no bother. I get it. But yeah, so... And I don't like. Yeah, it's, it's I don't a, like a, some a, of the propaganda that it produces. 
I know it, it, some yeah, of it I just I, feel I, is I, disingenuous. Some of the 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 releases that we get from crew to us, I feel are absolutely disingenuous. And anyone who has anything about them can see straight through them. But the vast majority of people are just that disenfranchised with it. They go, they, they don't even say anything. You know, they're like, oh, whatever, whatever. You know, okay. Um, but I know you're on the board for crew. Good job being you are pals in it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not on the board for crew. I've, I've I've just got myself onto the working group for crew for um, best practice. Uh, so little steps to get on the board of crew. You need to be a stakeholder. Uh, so I'd need to be a manufacturer or distributor and a much more wealthy than I currently. Well, there you am. go. There um, you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Just you've just summed up everything that I think about it. To get on the board, you have to be a manufacturer of poisons or a distributor of poisons. There you go. That's, that's a, a stakeholder. Actually, well, no, the stakeholder groups include um, the trade associations of both pest control, gamekeepers, uh, farmers, uh, all, all the way down. It has a huge list of stakeholders, which I have an investment. It's not just the uh, key manufacturers and distributors, although they are um, certainly a, 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 a integral part of the equation. There is a lot of other stakeholders that have a say. But the things with crew and all of these boards, again, so to you know disseminate this, uh, they all have um, working groups and task forces. And generally speaking, um, you can apply to be on a working group um, without necessarily being a member of that. Uh, the task forces are similar to the committees. You need to be a member of that organization to be um, involved in those. But when some of these uh, groups set up what they call working groups, they actually actively look for people outside of that clique to get involved because it brings in fresh perspectives, uh, perspectives uh, it brings in new ideas. It, it, it makes sure that the, the whole process is honest to what the, uh, the end game should be because otherwise it becomes an echo box. It, it's just the same people with the same ideas saying the same stuff. So actually, so that's, you guys, that, you that's know, what you, I you think, to, though. I tell you what, yeah. that that's next week's that's next week's topic. It's got to be, hasn't it? Um, trade associations and echo boxes and et cetera, et cetera. Because we've obviously just had a new trade association start up, haven't we? Yeah, in the earliest days, uh, what's it, UK PMS? Um, I, I saw that there, I saw a post on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't actually know any more about it. I mean, I'm interested to, to learn to see what they're doing because, of course, we already have two trade associations, both of which do, um, you know, phenomenal work in, in their own ways to their own uh, membership. Well, they, they do. I, they wouldn't be there if they if they weren't there. <laughs> Again, we might have some difference of opinion on this, but they kind of bookend the market already, don't they? We've we've got the MPTA at one side, we've got the BPCA at the other, uh, and they both have, um, you know, the same drive of, you know, where they want the industry to go, but they have different objectives as to how they're set out to achieve that. Um, I'm really interested to see where a third group would sit in that. Is it going to sit closer to one than the other? Is it going to try and split the line down the middle? Um, how's it? How's it going to? What's his unique selling point going to be? What's Why going don't to be we the try and get the guy on? What's he called? Do you know um, the lad? Sean Whelan. Do you know him? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can drop a message and, and, and ask. Uh, we could bring them all on if you like. We, we could have a real, real shindig. Um, they won't come on, though, will they? They won't come on. I, I know oh. Ian and uh, Steve from, from both of the other ones. Um, it, it might be a little bit outside their um scope of they'll interest be but... they'll be petrified exactly they'll be petrified of saying some of that backfires on them they won't so just to <laughs> let you know i've, I've asked knowing, sorry knowing, I've both, asked this knowing both ian people. and steve but no, knowing both ian and steve neither of those guys are afraid of speaking their mind uh in, in, in a in a wonderful way um so <laughs> i don't think that'd be a worry so i have a gentleman's bet we'll ask all three and i think they'll get the guy from the pme <laughs> on and you won't get the you might get you might get steve um, um, thingy, but I, I'd be surprised if we got BPC on. I'd be very surprised. You know, I just don't well, think this would hit that thing. But let let's see. I don't know. Yeah, let let let's see if that's next week. Then how well, where the industry really, we'll is and where it's going. Trade yeah, trade associations. Where that, the industry no, is I and think, where it's going. I think uh, I think trade associations. I think where the industry is and where it's going. Ah, oh, that is that is more than an hour. That is um, because where an is hour? it? Going? Get an hour. Get an hour. I think it's a good hour as well. And I think you'll get a lot of people asking. I, I tell you what, I bet you get a lot of people sitting watching that from all mm. um, 
I don't want to say walks of life from all different business perspectives. Um, you'll get a lot of um, silent people watching it from the big to the small companies because it'll appeal to a lot of people, especially if they're getting asked the questions that people would like them to be asked, but probably, no, pardon me, never do. And I think that will be interesting. But I'm yeah, it will be interesting to see which ones say yes, if any. And if they don't, then I'll just slag them all off. I'm only joking. I won't. I won't. I'll be honest. I'll give my honest. No, we, you know, we've had, we've had some good and some bad dealings with trade associations. Um, some really good and some really bad um, at both ends of it. And I know you've done a lot with BPC and stuff like that, haven't you? So it'll be interesting to see. And and, and MPK too. I mean, I'm, yeah. Wade Environmental has always been of the opinion that we are here for everyone. I mean, you, you asked before about this. Uh, I mean, just, just to put this into perspective, um, I think knowledge should be uh, available to everyone. Support should be available to everyone. We are um, we, we are beset on all sides in this industry. And, you know, people generally look at this industry as a bunch of people who, who enjoy, you know, um, killing things. And, and it's, it's an unfair, overgeneralization a lot of the time um and i don't think we do ourselves any favors inside this industry by infighting and squabbling so i've always mm. been very much of the opinion that i i am here personally and professionally for anybody in this industry any question you like any sort of like support you mm. need um i'll be there and uh, i think i've made it very clear on the forms and the rest of it um if you've got a question that i can answer in five minutes on the phone then phone me up and you know there's never going to be a charge for that because if you start nitpicking over these little bits and bobs um people stop asking questions and when people stop asking questions they make silly and avoidable mistakes so i'd much rather someone phone me up and said can i do this and be like no nah, nah, that is that's both wildly illegal and tremendously dangerous uh consider maybe doing this other thing and you know and that that five minute conversation has saved someone's um profession it saved you know the the environment uh and but if i sat there and said right um at the same of the tone you will be charged you know so many pence per minute people just put the phone down they wouldn't ask they, they would just disappear so um my when i said my business model's a bit crap it, it is because i believe that there shouldn't be a paywall on why, why do you not settle pelgar too i just like when I look at it, I think you crackers. You've got all that knowledge. You've got everything you need. You've got your dad who's been there, done it. Got the t-shirt of him, point you in the right direction. You set it up with a container. You know, you've got a farm that you can put containers on. Like why? You know about white labeling. You're almost starting where your dad started with all the knowledge that he didn't have when he started. I I, I just stand there and think, why? Why is there not? Because uh, it's what it's what inspires you at the end of the day, and yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe in a couple of years' time, then uh, yes, I will get into. You know, I'm already in the product development uh, side of things. I'm already in sort of like so. You know, I, I've, I've invented things that have appeared on the market, and you guys may or may not have used. Um, but at the moment, that's that's the level at which I'm happy to be at. Um, but you know, never say never. Um, maybe maybe there will be an opportunity in in years' time too start doing that but he has a question for you right and just last one to leave yeah. if you were me in my business and i was employing mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. alex wade come to work for me and you're me mm -hmm. what would you get alex wade to do as in what would yeah what would you get me to do for your so i'm uh, paying your wages from an outsider's mm -hmm. point of view Kill line employs Alex Wade and I'm paying his wages. What would I get him to do to get the best ROI on him? Um troubleshooting. That's what I'm really good at. That's what I enjoy. Trouble sites, hotspots, alternative thinking. Um, things that uh people have tried to do in conventional ways and then uh come up against a wall. Um, you know, the the knowledge of all of the products out there and the animals, it gives a alternative way of thinking that I think would probably suit you down to the ground. Yeah, well, that's that. Yeah, that's what we do on a day to day basis, isn't it? That's the type yeah. of stuff that gets my juices going. But just from the other end of the spectrum, compared to the way you do it, it's but you know, there's no. Mm. And this is the this is why I love pest control 
I love it, you know, and, and I know it's not cool to enjoy your work and to be a, a work <laughs> nerd and stuff like that, but I love it because there are no two, you know, no two problems are the same. Aren't there? Someone once said to me, if you've solved two problems the same, you've probably solved one incorrectly. And I was like, oh, what a great saying. I love that. <laughs> Do you know what that I mean? Is, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I also, you know, when I'm doing the training, uh, it's one of the things that actually I think uh, encourages a lot of people to, to stick with pest management is the fact that um, you're dealing with the same pests day in, day out. And you may be dealing with the same, you know, buildings and environments day in, day out. But never will the two be exactly the same. There never isn't. You, you will your your skill and your knowledge is based on a, an assumption of what may happen. But at that point, you have to draw a line in the sand and say, right, up until this point, I've got sixty percent of this licked by my you know knowledge and understanding of previous situations. But that mm-hmm. other forty percent is always going to be flexible. It's going to be dynamic and fluid, and that's the bit that requires me to have this wealth of information that I can pick apart and dissemble to solve that problem. And it's problem solving, isn't it? All the way through. It's a new puzzle every day. Um, and it's, it's never the same one twice. And I think that's why it appeals to uh, so many uh, personality types within our industry, because mm. it is, it is that constant problem solving. Yeah. I know we were sitting there saying, could we get enough content to do one of these every week? I think we're getting enough content to do one of these every day. Couldn't we? Like every time you're saying stuff, I'm thinking that would be a good one. That would be a good one. That would be a good one. Yeah, but I look forward to it. Okay, well, next week, let's see. Can I leave it with you to speak to them three people? Um, Yeah, I'll tell you what. I think having three people on this all at the same time would be cluttered as F. So with that, let's talk to Sean first, because we're all aware of the BPC and NPT. We're roughly aware of what they stand for. It might be interesting to see um, what Sean has to say. for this but actually because you know at the moment this is being pre-recorded as you guys may imagine we're putting it up but we're going to try and do and find a way to do these live so you can all interact with and talk to us and throw comments up as, as you go along so very you know if anyone if if anyone's actually got this far to listen to this if you've actually managed to get all the way to the end drop a comment at the end of this uh on topics that you guys would like to hear about on discussion points that you'd like us to hear now you know a little bit more about the pair of us you understand where we came from you know, we've got uh, Sean, boots on the ground, doing this day in, day out. You've got me, uh, who, who's come at this from a completely other angle. We're always going to have, we're not going to necessarily have uh, a, a conflict of, of, of interest and information here. But certainly, I, I, I think any of these discussions, there is going to be many ways to skin the proverbial uh, mm. with this. And so please put your comments in at the bottom, put, put these um points of interest in and we'll try and cover them and like i say we'll try and make this live we'll probably put it up on uh either youtube or facebook or or some platform like that where you can get involved um and and from there we can we can just try and build a bit of a a community around this and get your feedback because this is for everyone um Uh, yeah not just us having a chat it's got to add value hasn't it it's got to add value but yeah and again i can't stress it enough if you want to have a chat then every other friday the pest manager, P, P, M, N, pest managers network and event or whatever it is, yeah. a Zoom group every other Friday. Great place, great place to talk to people and to learn some stuff. And uh, yeah, it yeah, it's fantastic. Isn't it? Last week we had uh, you know not to name names because they may not want to be named, but we had a gentleman on there who is self funding his way through all of his entomology uh, degrees to the point of mm-hmm. he's doing he's doing his entomological um you know from from the states i'm trying to remember the name of it now but some really high grade stuff um and he's doing this all himself he's doing it all off his own back and i mean oh how amazing is that um we all struggle to get 20 cpd points a year and this guy's doing a self-funded masters just so he can be a better um certified you know field biologist um mm-hmm. so there's some really interesting characters out there uh, not just not just us two numpties chatting away to each other all night. Yeah, no, the, the, there's the, yeah, there's lots and lots of people from mm-hmm. different um, sectors of pest control, isn't it? And the more that gets on it, the the, the better it gets, than it, and the the yeah. less that particular, you know, I always feel like sometimes after maybe, you know, I say a bit because there's there's some people who come on and just watch, which is fine, and but the, when it, I find it nice when you can just go on and have a bit of input, but actually listen to the other people as well. I find that really, yeah. you know, people say stuff and you think, what? Like, never even considered it. And then maybe it's a week after that, Asian Hornets. Yeah. Asian <laughs> yes, Hornets, eh? Yeah, That'd Asian be fun. Hornets. They're here to stay on there. 
Oh yeah, I just and just um, I saw today a post went up about Asian Hornets once again, uh, and I won't name names because uh, I think they've corrected it by now. But a post about Asian Hornets with a picture of the Japanese giant, um, giant Hornet, yeah. giant, giant Hornet, giant Hornet, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> swing and a miss from yeah. right, right to your locale. Yeah. But, uh, if you if you can keep thing. your eye out for one of these, you know. Good news is we haven't seen any of them in this country. No, no, they've known it's not. Yeah, yeah, it is. The problem is is. with with their big red heads, and I'm sure you've seen on the Asian Hornet uh, identification group. Every time that picture of the uh, giant hornet gets put up there, because it's got a nice big orange red head, it looks very similar um, at a glance to. We know not very similar, but the orange head of this giant hornet looks similar to the the ready rusty orange head of our common hornet. About 12 months ago, I honestly thought Asian hornets were giant hornets. I'd seen that many posts with it. I was talking to Robert (laughs) Moon and he was like, they keep getting the photo wrong, don't they? And I was like, yeah, of course they do. I was thinking, do they? I had to go back and I looked and I was like, oh yeah, they don't look like that. It's a good job I wasn't out looking for them. I never would have spotted one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Just covered in them, being like, oh, I don't know what these are, but definitely no. I tell you what, it's going to be um, it's going to be a very interesting time not this summer, next summer, the summer after, except our wasps and FICAM and Asian hornets and, and all that. There is a massive twist, and I think there's a, a huge opportunity for the right firms to um, capitalise and really cement themselves as experts. You know what um, BPCA have asked me to speak at? So I'm speaking at Pest X next year. E. Uh, do you know what they've asked me to speak about at Pest X? What? Alternative control methods for wasps. So yeah, it's it'd quite, be nice to actually. Well, that feeds into my narrative of not really trusting them, doesn't it? So there you go. But they, yeah. the only thing they've asked me to do was write an article on um, um, alternative wasp control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I honestly believe it's just so that we leave the chemical manufacturers alone for losing FICAM because the industry's got the nicker than a twist over it. And I was like, all right, yeah. And then when. Yeah. Anyways, that's by the by. So that that doesn't surprise us. And but I think it's a positive step forward yeah. as an industry, you know. And if you can cure bed bugs in a house, these tiny little things, tiny little legs that you don't see, that are a total nightmare. A load of wasps going into a hole <laughs> with a <laughs> nest behind it that you've just got to get the poison into shouldn't be a Rubik's cube, should it? You know, we should be capable <laughs> of doing it, but. Uh, there we go. That's yeah, yeah. Right. Next Friday, let's see if um, uh, Sean Whelan. Yeah. And I'm not being rude here. I I don't know many people in the pest control industry, I'm, and I certainly don't know the the upper echelon. So it's not it's not that I I just I'm a bit oily. I think for some of them, so I probably don't sit that well with them. So it would be nice to get someone like Sean on and have a chat with them about the. Um, I just keep calling it the PME, and that's so wrong because that's something totally different, isn't it? That's the Pest Management Alliance, which is a yeah. very different thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll cover all that. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can get them on. We'll have a nap. And it's been lovely to speak to you, Alex. Absolutely. You too. And uh, yeah, everyone watching at home, uh, thank you for getting this far. Uh, you're absolute troopers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll God see bless. You. We'll see you next time. Okay, mate. God bless. See you soon. See you soon. Bye.